take a few moments of their day. Thank you, Lubna. Uh, to find out which unceded or treated territories you may live and work on. You can use the link www.native-land.ca to learn more. And I believe uh, Lubna will put that in the chat feature. Um, okay, so for those of you that do not know me, my name is Julie and I am the peer program coordinator for Spinal Cord Injury Ontario in the London region. I'd also like to introduce you to my co-host today, Lubna. She is the manager of our peer program. Um, so just a couple of rules of engagement before we begin. Uh, we are gonna keep everybody muted throughout the presentation just to cut back on background noise. And as I believe Lubna put in the chat as well, we are recording this session. Um, so if you don't wish to be seen, please just ensure that your video is turned off. Um, we will, however, throughout the presentation be using um, the chat feature. So if you have any questions, um, you're more than welcome to raise your hand because it's gonna be a very informal sort of question and answer session. Um, so either raise your hand and we'll call on you to ask your question or please feel free to use the chat function um, as well. So today we've got two individuals with us who have a lot of experience with traveling with a disability. Um, so they'll be sharing some of their experiences and are, and are happy to answer any questions that you have. As I said, feel free to use the chat feature and um, raise your hand. So uh, before we begin with the introductions, we're gonna play a short video. Uh, and after that, Shauna and Marilyn will both introduce themselves. That's one issue. You're one not in particular. Uh, the terminal. Uh, do you have the remote? Maybe the first. Yeah. Oh, maybe it's on here that you change it? Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Never tried that, actually. Uh, That's the one thing we did not try. Hopefully that works then. From Alaska to Alexandria, Ephesus to Reykjavik, the world is your oyster when it comes to accessible travel possibilities. With a bit of extra planning and foresight, the sky is the limit when it comes to planning your dream vacation. Consider the following tips towards ensuring a successful journey. Determine what kinds of travel best suits you. You can take a very quick travel personality quiz at www.besttripchoices.com for feedback on the kinds of travel experiences and destinations that you might enjoy the most. Consider working with a travel agency that specializes in arranging vacations for persons with a disability and that you can trust, respect, and depend upon to make sure that all of your needs are taken care of. Inform your travel agent in detail about the nature of your disability and your specific needs with relation to transportation, accommodation, and medical equipment. You may wish to consider renting medical equipment such as a Hoyer lift, hospital bed, or commode chair as long as you recognize that they may not meet the same standards that you are used to at home. Consider renting or purchasing a travel commode chair or a bath bench that can be packed and checked as baggage, which, if properly labeled as medical equipment, should not incur any additional fees. Take special care of the contents of your carry-on luggage and ensure that you are traveling with enough medical supplies clothing and medication should there be any delay in receiving your luggage at the other end. Keep medications in their original labeled containers and bring copies of your prescriptions with you. Don't let a flat tire ruin your trip. Travel with an emergency repair kit for your mobility device and don't wait until your trip to learn how to use it. Be familiar with how to assemble, disassemble your mobility equipment. A laminated set of instructions affixed to your chair while in transit can avoid some unpleasant surprises on the other end. Determine what your transportation needs will be at destination and ensure that arrangements are made and confirmed in writing well ahead of time. Determine with written confirmations all of the arrangements that have been made with regards to your travel itinerary. Travel with a number of small US dollar bills while tipping is generally not mandatory, it can go a long ways towards getting the extra service and attention that you may need and that you will certainly appreciate. 
Travel insurance is imperative to protect yourself against unforeseen circumstances, whether it be lost luggage, medical complications, or an emergency requiring an early trip home. Learn some basic phrases in the language of the countries that you'll be visiting. A simple per favore and grazie can go a very long way. Dove un bagna per sedia a hotel? Where is a wheelchair accessible bathroom? Can also come in handy. And make sure that you know where the bathroom is before you need to use it. Adopt a half full attitude and let consideration, courtesy, and civility be your guideposts towards ensuring an incredible and successful journey. Above accessible travel tips were provided by Shauna Petrie. If you are planning a trip and would like to get in touch with her for help, her bio and contact information are in the description section of this video. Okay, Sean, if you want to go ahead and or Marilyn. Sorry, go ahead, Shauna, you can introduce okay. yourself. Hi there, um, my name is Shauna Petrie. Um, just, you know, I've, uh, I had a spinal cord injury in 1981, June 13th, 1981, that's uh, like 41 years ago. So quite, wow. uh, quite some time. And I have to tell you, um, I was living in Ottawa at the time and had always been an avid winter person involved with cross country skiing. And I can tell you that that very first winter using a wheelchair, just that was the most traumatic experience I think I've had in addition to my accident. And so I was just determined that I had to go somewhere warm. I had to get away, go somewhere hot. And one of the very first things that I obsessed about was booking a vacation. And that little video that you just saw, unfortunately I didn't have any of those things in mind and essentially all I did was like go to a travel agency told them I wanted a wheelchair accessible like one week all-inclusive vacation they said oh here you go I went to it was called the uh, Jack Tar Village in St. Kitts and that was my very very first travel experience I was 17 years old traveling by myself and off I went and I got to the destination and I'm telling you the bathrooms were all 24 inch wide at 20 inches wide which there aren't too many people that fit through that doorway and there were stairs throughout the poverty. It was, I was just horrified and that, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And I was very lucky that there were some uh, very nice people that uh, came along and chiseled, literally chiseled out a couple inches of wood off my bathroom door. So I'd get in the bathroom and built ramps, like overnight, there's gonna be ramps go up around the property. So, I mean, it all, all's well that ends well, but I have to tell you after that, I became absolutely obsessed with ensuring that all subsequent vacations were much more organized and I started to do a lot of research on destinations because despite how the journey began I really really became addicted to travel and here I am 41 years later and I'm still um, I'm married I've got a, a 31 year old daughter uh, she's a flight attendant actually with Air Canada so following a little bit in her mother's passion for travel and I'm just here today to help share any kind of experiences answer any questions and uh, let people know that there are opportunities out there. My particular uh, passion and addiction is cruising. And I've spent, as of my last vacation, I just got back from a 14 day trip on what's called an ABC cruise. It's Aruba, Bonaire and Curacao. And so mm. uh, I returned on the 16th of May. And so I'm just, uh, just past 300 days at sea. So all that to say, that is my area of passion and expertise. So anything you want to know about cruising, uh, let me know. And I have to say that Marilyn is about to come up. Uh, she and I had the pleasure of traveling together uh, several years ago, but not, not right. that long ago. And it was, uh, it was incredible. So all I can say is like, if you can find a way to do it, it is from my perspective, the most therapeutic thing that you can do. Like as someone with a spinal cord injury, that is my therapy. So over to you, Marilyn. Okay. Thanks, Shauna. That was a good trip that we did. Um, so I had my spinal cord injury 29 years ago this summer in August, and I C5-6 quadriplegic. So unlike Shauna, I travel with a power chair. And um, I started traveling shortly after my injury, probably a couple years after. Um, I hadn't even really traveled 
as an adult until I was 30 years old. And then I had my accident when I was 32. So I wanted to continue that. And I think I've been going to quite a few places since then. Now, unlike Shauna, I don't really like doing cruises. Um, we like to find hostels and out of the way places and um, it's an adventure, but as in Shauna's little intro video, I find, especially as a power wheelchair user, that you really have to um, plan. I think I spend more time planning than I do actually the time on the trip, but in the end, it's, it's really, really well worth it. Um, and I would suggest to anyone, depending on their ability or what their um, desire, what to see is I would go somewhere local first, like say, Toronto to Vancouver and then if you do have a problem but you're not too far from home and you have all your uh, Canadian benefits to go along with it so that's um, yeah okay thanks for the introduction so I think we've already got a question uh, go ahead Shannon um yeah I'm just wondering with cruises is it easy to get on and off the boat like the ramps and that are they made that wheelchairs, like power chairs, can go on and off easy enough? Um, yes, they are. For the most part, most of the major cruise lines, everything is ramped because they have so many people are going on and um, whether it be walkers, wheelchairs, you name it. But essentially, there's always someone there to assist. So even if you're with a traveling companion, I know that there's always someone there that's there to assist me. They want you on and off of that ship very safely. So they take ownership of that experience and they're very, very good at it. They tend to use two persons. They'll have one at the back, one at the front. And from what I've seen, certainly in recent years, they really know what they're doing. So the, the embarkation is disembarkation from the ship is not really an issue. Oh, good. Thank you. Sometimes it get very steep, if the, depending on the tide. But like Shauna said, there's always someone to help you. Yeah, I'm sure they don't want any injuries themselves. No. <laughs> um, okay, we've got another question from Nikki. Hi there. My question is about cruising again. Um, you know when they have a, like a tender to get off the boat and you have to go to a different, like another island or something? Um, so how is that done? Because a lot of excursions, you have to get onto a tender to get onto the, like, to the land area and stuff. So how do you deal with that? Okay, and that's a great question. Very honestly, I do. When I'm looking at itineraries, I try and minimize the tender experience because mm -hmm. tendering, some of the cruise lines do a really good job at it. So there's Royal Caribbean as a parent company, there's Royal Caribbean Celebrity and Alzamara. They have a very good tender system. Um, and that it, particularly the newer ships, but uh, your odds of getting off on a tender are very, very good. But as Marilyn mentioned um, in a previous comment, there are situations which over which the cruise line has no control. So you may enter into an area, and this happened to my husband and I, and it was a transatlantic sailing, and it was one of the ports going into to Greenland. And we got there, and the, the seas were just too rough. But it turned out it wasn't just myself and my husband that couldn't get off the ship. No one was allowed off of the ship in, in those instances. So the only mm -hmm. time I've not been able to get off in the tender is when the rest of the guests as well. And that's where having that sort of open-minded frame of mind. Like we had a trip where we had three different ports of call. One day we were supposed to be in Newfoundland and instead we ended up in Halifax and there was a port uh, okay. in. So just, just to be aware that things, mm -hmm. those kinds of things can happen. And that's where that whole flexibility and, and c'est la vie thing comes into play. Yeah. But the reason, sorry, the reason why I'm asking is that we're doing an Alaskan cruise, uh, June, sorry, mid August. Okay. And um, I've been inquiring about excursions and I still haven't heard back and it's been almost two months and I don't know what the delay is. They're having a hard time finding uh, excursions for that are wheelchair accessible. Um, and even if you go on the website, they do it. They, they advertise that they're accessible. So my travel agent went and checked and then he's been told they're not accessible. So it's really frustrating, you know, to what? deal with that. The but here's the positive is I can tell you of all of the cruises that I've ever done, uh, the Alaskan cruise had the most accessible ports of call because everything is in the United States and the United States, they're governed under the Americans with Disabilities Act. 
And so okay. there is so much that, that is accessible. And I'm just, can you tell me what cruise line you're actually traveling with? Yeah, it's with uh, the Celebrity. Okay. Um, then from August 21st to the 28th. Okay. Yeah. They actually have an accessible shore excursion department. There's a direct email. Um, and I, I don't know how, I'll try and put it in the chat after I'll, I'll yeah. pull it up. But there, there is an email where you can communicate directly with their accessible shore excursion department. So you don't need okay. to go to your travel agent. You can deal directly with them and okay. they'll be able to pull up the excursion. In fact, they would have a document outlining all of their accessible options. And on the particular sailing you'd be doing, there would be options in every single port of call. And the okay. other thing is the, the ports themselves are uh, quite, so if you, you were going into Juno, for example, yes. you would be getting off the ship and there's a, it's, it's not very far to get to, if there's a gondola which is an amazing mm -hmm. thing. The gondola, you go up the gondola, it's a beautiful panoramic view of the city. Mm -hmm. And then at the very top of the gondola, you get off and there's an interpretive center and everything within that center is accessible. There's two levels, there's an elevator, there's different, um, okay, there's movies, yeah, there's artifacts. So yeah, there's one for it. Stops. Mm -hmm. And Skag, are you going to Skagway? Uh, no. It's, you know what, I can't remember the ports, but Juno is one of them for sure. I'll be uh, sure and put that email in the chat for you. Um, okay. If I don't manage to accomplish that, okay. I will make sure it's communicated and that, that you get that because the, that's really deal directly with the cruise line on your excursions and get something all, uh, all good to go. And okay. some of them you can even deal directly with the suppliers and I'll, um, for anyone that might be going, so I mentioned Skagway because that was one where I got off the ship. And right yeah. there, there's a train and it was like a three hour, it was called the White Pass Scenic Railway. And oh. you literally like got on the train and they had the wheelchair tie downs and it was just absolutely beautiful. But the rest of the town, the other half of the day, mm -hmm. it was all, everything was sort of walking distance and close by. So the nice thing with that itinerary is in a very worst case scenario where you don't line up something formally, I think you'll find the ports of call very good to navigate. But I will, I'm going to look that up right now and try yes. and email thank that you. through. Okay, You're thank welcome. you very um, okay, so we've got a few other hands up. Uh, Lise, you can go ahead and ask your question. If you just want to, oh, yep, there you go. Okay, um, I'm a travel agent by profession, uh, not working right now. Anyway, I have a basic question about Air Canada. Uh, I had heard horror stories about a gentleman traveling with a power chair where they took his power chair apart to put it in the hold and uh, he could barely even be plain because they couldn't put his chair back together. And my second part to the question is, how do they get a wheelchair person into a seat on an airplane. I haven't been able to figure that out. <laughs> Marilyn, why don't you answer that from your perspective in terms of traveling with the power chair and then I can add in. Okay, but one thing with the power chair, you have to remember that it's not actually the airline that's looking after the power chair, it's the airport and the staff that is hired by the airport. So everyone always blames the airlines and I don't think that's fair because it's not really uh, their responsibility um, to get that chair on the plane. Now, I know that um, what we do when we travel with my power chair is we duct tape, tie it up, no loose pieces. We put um, O-rings on each corner so that they have something to hold on to. So you try to think of trying to pick up a 350 pound wheelchair and put it up onto a ramp. It makes, it's very, very difficult. Um, so by putting these little O-rings on each corner, it um, allows them to pick it up easier and I've never had any damage, knock on wood. Now for getting on the plane, some, um, some airports, have the, oh, Shauna, what's the name of it? The, the Eagle Lift, where it's like a Hoyer lift and they pick you up and they take you down the aisle way. 
Um, there's also a George Washington chair, what they call, uh, they call a George Washington chair. And it's a very narrow aisle chair where they transfer you on the jet bridge from your chair or uh, airport chair into the aisle chair and then they take you down and with two people, they'll lift you up and transfer you to the um, air, airport chair. And, and if, you're you're a big, if you're a big person? Well, I mean, I've, I've gained a few pounds in the last few years and I didn't take it down the aisle. And I've seen people a lot bigger with, than me, so I'm not sure how they would do that, unless you sit in the very first chair in the bulkhead seating, and then but you wouldn't you, have to go through the aisle. Uh, only able-bodied people are supposed to be allowed to sit in the bulkheads in case there's no. a crowd. No. I sit no? in the bulkhead because I'm, I'm very tall, so I but have a deal with yeah. No, it's only the um, emergency doors you're not allowed to sit. Okay, that's changed then maybe. Maybe I've got it wrong. Uh, it's been a while since I've worked in the business, but yeah. But thank you for that, I appreciate it. Yeah, I don't, I, Ishana, what would you say if someone oh. is overweight? Well, one thing I just wanted to add in is, is in, in the worst case scenario, it's also being prepared that things do happen. And just on my most very most recent trip, after everything you say about take everything off your chair, protect it, bring it on board. And generally I do. And so I have on my chair, I have uh, like the only moving parts really that could come off would be my cushion. And I have two side guards. And when I went to, I got into the aisle chair to get on the plane, took my cushion off, but the side guards would not come out. They were just like, they were wedged in there because I never take them out. So, and they were the, the carbon fiber custom cut to the wheel, uh, I didn't know how much they actually cost. So I might have found a way to yank them out a little better. And I actually said to the people taking down my chair, I said, you know what, this will be fine as long as they're not turning the chair upside down. Yeah. And somehow when I got in my chair, um, it was missing a side guard. And I have to tell you that having, that there's nothing, there's nothing you could do at the time. I mean, there, there was no finding it. I just, but I want people to know what happens if you do, if there is any damage to your chair or something like that is absolutely imperative that before you leave that airport that you go and you would go, it would be in the baggage area and you would make a report. You want to make a report right away that this is what's happened with your chair so that they know. And there is some, there's a company that most of the airlines are dealing with now. It's called Scoot Around. I used to use them just for people who wanted to rent scooters. But in my instance, that was, they referred me to scoot around. Now, had my chair been completely damaged beyond repair, they would have somehow uh, provided me with a chair. Like the airline, there are certain things the airline needs to do, and they would have provided or tried to provide uh, a chair. Now, keep in mind, everyone's chair, as you know, like is fairly customized, and it would be very hard for an off-the-shelf chair to be suitable for me in any way. And the amazing thing is I'd actually, um, and I know Leander is on here today, Leander, has very patiently tried several times to teach me how to change my own tire. And I have to tell you, I, I have yet to this day to be able to successfully do that. And I was on a cruise once where the, the tire just blew. Like it literally, I wasn't even going anywhere, but periodically there might be a little bit of debris, something happens. And I was so incredibly impressed that there's a whole engineering department underground that are like, literally they took my wheel and they had it fixed. So that was great. And so this time, with the missing side guard and I have, I'll show you. This was, I had just one of these. And what happens is when you are missing one side guard, your body like spreads to whatever, <laughs> like this is what keeps me in. And so I had one inside of me that was just perfect. And then the other side that was rubbing on the wheel and that just was not good from many perspectives. And it was really imperative that I sort something out. And literally the, the moment I got on the cruise line, my cabin steward, I showed him this, I explained the situation. They brought it to this magical place where I'm not allowed to go. It's somewhere in the bowels of the ship. But I, without exaggeration, they came back with, they literally cut one out of a very durable plastic right down to the guards and made me a temporary side guard that wow. I am like using to this day um, because now I'm dealing with air can I've put in a claim 
and they will be reimbursing the cost of the side guard. I, but the only thing is right now with the supply chain issue there, um, it's gonna take a few months. So anyway, all that to say, make sure you do make a claim because some of these things, it turns out for two of these, the, or one of these, just one, one of these guards was in the ballpark of about $750. And that was because of the customization where it was specifically cut to the size of my wheel. It was sort of something that was important to me because I transfer over my side guard and I didn't want them too big and, or too low. So I paid that premium when I bought them. So I will say I was very impressed with how the airline, they issued a claim number right away. They put me in touch with Scoot Around right away and the wheels got moving, so to speak, on, um, on addressing it. But I will tell you that for my next trip, I now I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I will always travel because I'm now going to have an extra sure. side guard. I will always travel the next extra side guard. I've also just ordered a second set of brakes and extra bearings. I've always had the extra tubes, but as a result of this trip, I'm now going to have the whole little kit because I just don't ever want that panic again of, of having something go wrong and not be able to access the part. And my trip started in Fort Lauderdale, which is a very modern, very progressive, a lot of accessibility, a lot of wheelchair accessible stores. But what happens is because of the cost now of carrying this inventory, places aren't carrying them. Essentially, you they need to order in a part. So that wasn't going to happen in that short period of time. So yeah. big though, thumbs up to the cruise line. And just so anyone knows, like if you have something go wrong, do let them know because they will go out of their way. They want you leaving that ship, giving it like full thumbs up. And I have to say, wow, was I ever impressed with that side guard that they constructed for me? So. Thank you. This, the hotels can be very helpful too. When um, I went a trip through my work to South Korea and we blew up the charger and English was not very many people's first or second language and they were able to find me a charger order it and have it delivered to my room the next day. That's some very good customer service. Awesome. Um, okay, Alan, go ahead with your question. You'll just have to unmute yourself, Alan. Oh, there you go. Yeah, you okay now? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, I was like yourselves. I used to be an avid traveler. Hostels, all works. Fantastic. Um, I've been uh, quadriplegic, C3, C4, no use of my limbs at all. My question is regarding air, or, uh, the air pressure in a plane. I've been afraid to go into a plane again because I know whenever you, know, you take off, you're up there, you feel the air pressure on your body, on your chest. My breathing is compromised and I'm worried I'd get up there and there'd be uh, just some undue pressure that would make me feel I shouldn't be here. Do you have anything, you know, anything about that? Again, I'm C3, C4, so you know, fa fairly high up. Difficulty in breathing. I have never experienced that myself, but I do know people that have very high level level of injury with no arm movement whatsoever that have okay. trauma. Um, and I've never heard them mention um, okay. any experiences like that. So I, would that, I think would, that would just be maybe a temporary thing on landing and takeoff where you can just feel the, the, the pressure. And then once you're up at, uh, what's that cruising speed, then it would be okay? Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Shauna, have you ever heard of anyone experiencing I, it? I've never had anyone have any issues with that. And I work with a number of individuals with all different levels of, um, of disability. It, um, there's, the, the technology is advanced so incredibly, like in terms of within the cabin itself, like the equalization factor. Hardly, yeah. my daughter would probably be a better person to answer what goes on from a technological perspective on the aircraft. But it, um, you, you should be okay, but it's the kind of thing you might want to discuss with a doctor if there's something 
that for whatever reason they feel would compromise your ability to travel safely, um, you'd want to look into that. But the good news is, very honestly, I don't know anyone who's ever experienced that um, and who hasn't yeah. had a successful experience. That's maybe just correct. a short flight too, like maybe to Ottawa or, yeah. or something like that, just to try it out and see how you feel. Mm -hmm. And usually with fear, it's always um, people just sharing their lived experience. Obviously, when we do not have individuals on this call who are the same level of injury as you, um, we won't be able to find you a good match for your lived experience. But um, your doctor may know someone if you have a physiatrist. Uh, they may know someone else who has a similar level of injury and could respond to your concerns. But I really like the idea that, you know, try out a short flight from Toronto to Ottawa or something similar like that um, to, to, to test it out. And then you could always take the train home if you didn't like it. <laughs> Alan has one other question and, and maybe it's beyond the scope of the group that's here because of the level of injury, but he obviously doesn't have upper body control well, how, do, how do, does anybody have any experience with seeing or being around a high level injury person on a plane? How does he sit in a seat when he has no control of upper body? Is that a silly question? <laughs> I know for me personally, I, I do have some upper body, but not very much. So I'm paralyzed from the chest down and I just have the chair tilted um, much to the chagrin behind me um, except for takeoff and landing I have my chair tilted back the whole time and I believe I know someone else that has brought um, a seat belt contraption and wraps it around the entire chair to keep them upright or there's always pillows prop some pillows up on either side yeah. Yeah. thank you thanks Alan for your questions Thank you. Uh, Leander, go ahead. Hi. Um, my first uh, question, I guess, refers back to the cruises at the beginning. Um, Shana, do a lot of cruise lines publish the excursion suppliers so that if you encounter a situation like was mentioned by someone earlier, where they're not getting a response quickly, that you would be able to see who the supplier is and reach out to them yourselves to get a more uh, prompt uh, reply as to their accessibility. Um, and then uh, just second question, do you think there's value in taking a photograph of your chair, uh, having it on your phone prior to your departure in the event that your chair is lost or stolen? I mean, lost or damaged, um, yeah. I'll start with the, the second question first is that absolutely having a photo and this same age is so simple with your iPhone, cell phone, whatever, absolutely take a picture of your chair before you leave because that was one of the pieces of information that I was asked to submit with my claim was like a photograph of, of my chair. So you can see from my chair that clearly I, I had side guards. I mean, it would be a, you know, quite the, Imagine if I went and I had no side guards and decided to, oh, I think I'll get some new ones. But having the picture is absolutely what helps make a, a speedy claim. And there's no questions. It's like, okay, this is what you had. You don't know. And, um, and it will be dealt with. So that's definitely a very good idea. Um, and secondly, as far as you're asking about the excursions, unfortunately, the cruise lines do not, um, do not disclose like their suppliers. And part of the reason for that is they shore excursions is a big business for them like that's a big part of the the business component to the cruise line so um that's they they want people booking their excursions with them and that being said if you deal with the slip well whether it be celebrity royal caribbean azamar if you deal directly with their accessible shore excursion department that department will liaise with the supplier so they won't put you in touch with them but they specifically will get in touch with them to ask the questions that you need to, um, to have answered. And I, what I would also recommend and what I always do, um, for example, the two, um, two of the ports that I was just in, uh, one being Aruba and one was Bonaire, the cruise lines had told me they, they just, they didn't have anything that they could offer me, but a very quick Google search pulled out. There were two companies in Bonaire 
um, I went with one, it was called Roro. And it was a, a gentleman who was quadriplegic who uh, decided he didn't like winters. He was from the Netherlands. So he and his brother and his family moved to Bonaire and they started a, a company where they, they used his accessible van for tourists who come in and would like a, a day tour. And it was very recently priced. And it was, uh, I, I felt very good about supporting like the local economy, supporting this individual. And the same thing happened in Aruba. There was, uh, and, and I, I'll get the name and, and share that after, but it was his, the name of the company is something like, we love, we welcome wheelchairs. And I think they have an Instagram account. And I honestly believe that's what it's called is we welcome wheelchairs. And it was, uh, once again, it was a, a gentleman, uh, he and his wife decided this was something they really wanted to do. They wanted to make their island more accessible and available to people. And so we spent a full day um, with this gentleman doing an, an island tour and once and and there's nothing better than having that personalized service as opposed to like a large group excursion so i would very much encourage people to see what they can do on a personal level first and then use the the cruise line excursion as a as a backup i guess the only disadvantage to that is you are guaranteed to return to the ship in time with with something you line up with them. Marilyn makes a, a very good point. That is one thing. This is where the cruise lines put the fear of God into people in terms of yeah. make it clear. If you book your own excursion, if you miss the boat, you are on your own to get to the next port of call. And I have seen it happen. It, it does happen. People get involved. It often happens in ports like San Juan or ones where there are drinking ports. There's a lot of pubs and things like that where people go and they lose track of time. They're enjoying the, the local atmosphere and they literally miss the boat and it is will be at your own expense. And so you do wanna be very cognizant of that. What I have found is people that are offering the tours are tend to be very aware that you need to be back at a certain time and you always like make sure you you go on the, on the earlier side of things. But that that is an important thing to note. Because I, I have seen I have seen it happen and they're ruthless. The cruise lines get charged for every extra minute. Like if they're supposed to leave at four, if they're there any minute after four, they are charged for that. So they are leaving. They are going at four. They are not waiting. Unless, of course, we're on a cruise line excursion and something has happened, the cruise line will wait. So that is the advantage of traveling with the cruise line excursions. Okay, Phil, go ahead. Hi, um, I probably one that has a bit of a horror story from the last time I flew uh, my last vacation. Uh, my wife and I um, coming home, they caused like $9,000 damage to my wheelchair. Um, they stuffed it in there good. Um, I, I remember flying in, got into Toronto, waiting and waiting and waiting for my chair to come out. And finally, somebody came out an hour later and says, oh, it took us. 45, 50 minutes to get your chair out. They had uh, jammed it in so hard, it caused electrical damage to the to the plane itself. And uh, yeah, ended up being $9,000 uh, damage to my wheelchair. Mine was great. They just went into great mode. Um, they filled out and got all the paperwork done the next morning. I had a call by 10 o'clock in the morning uh, that they were sending somebody out to get it to assess and to find out what needed to be done. Um, but uh, I'm transitioning into a manual chair. So our next trip, I'm taking a manual chair. I am <laughs> doing the, the power chair again. No, 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 no. Uh -uh. It's uh, once was enough. Uh, to go through that. Um, another question asked uh, uh, because belts you can get from uh, Body Point that are Velcro, and it would be perfect. You could slip it around the back of the seat and around yourself, and it would hold you in. And I think they're like about five inches wide. Uh, they have some that are a little less, but they have some uh, wider ones. But uh, they. Uh, they work great and you can cut them to length. They're pretty long. So I'm sure it would wrap around the back of the seat and around you and keep you held in nicely. Um, but uh, 
yeah, I'm definitely love traveling and we've traveled to, I travel also with a service dog and uh, I've taken my last service dog to Europe. I've had him out in California, took him to BC twice and, uh, and everywhere else we've went and uh, it's great. They put you in a bulkhead seat um, on our way to Europe. Uh, they had, had us in a bulkhead seat. Uh, there was two extra seats for him to stretch out and some people played oh we like where you're sitting and moved in there and I just said uh excuse me he can't sit in the in the aisle and he can't sit in my lap he's 85 pounds you know so a few minutes later they moved me and the wife up to first class so it was uh it was kind of a nice uh surprise but uh the airlines are great with uh, people with disabilities I found that's every experience except Air Canada. I hate Air Canada. Never fly with them again. <laughs> Terrible experience. But uh, not yeah, Shonda's done. <laughs> no, 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 no. It wasn't the stewardess. It was just the, the seat was broken and it, it moved all around the whole time and it, it just a lot of problems. So yeah, it was it was that from a technical spot. But uh, yeah. Um but uh, yes, I'm one of the lucky ones that's had my wheelchair damaged badly. But uh, don't, I'm not discouraging anybody from going. Uh, the best thing I know what to do is just like a lot of people do is like uh, Marilyn, uh, do what you, you know. Um, to my horror, I was looking out the window when they were loading my chair too, and they picked it up about six guys picked it up and flopped it on its side, and I just visions of horror you know i thought oh great this is going to be really wonderful you know um and then when we got back it was yeah it was pleasant nice pleasant surprise at two in the morning you know <laughs> but uh yeah i would say to anybody travel but do your, your work and another great thing is doing a, a card with instructions for your chair and uh, make them aware of it laminate it and have it right there so they know what to do and in the language of the country you're trying to... yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah i've had some good experiences uh going to other countries and uh they uh just handled it really great but uh yeah shauna were you going sure. to respond to something phil was saying or no, I said I was just I was pleased to hear that they did in fact um, handle things like boom, 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 and the and and also as he was mentioning on a subsequent trip, he's going to take his manual chair, and if that is ever an option, so let's say you're you're going to an all inclusive for a week, and you're going to be staying at a resort and really not going a lot of places. If you're traveling with somebody and you can like get by using the manual chair for the week, it yeah. is definitely a lot less stressful <laughs> from the perspective yes. of, I mean, the, the power chairs are so expensive. I mean, manual chairs yeah. are crazy expensive these yeah. days too, but there's less that can go wrong with them on the plane. And it's just, it's it's it always breaks my heart when I hear about something like that with the, the power chairs, because I know how I, devastating that is. And regardless of the fact that the mm -hmm. airline will fix it, it's like even, you know, here's my little side guard and I'm lamenting the side guard because it's been quite the, yeah. quite the hassle. But absolutely, if people have that option to travel with the manual chair, um, especially keeping in mind the nature of the trip, because literally if you're at an all-inclusive and you're spending the week, um, because I don't always do cruises. Uh, we did a family thing in Punta Cana and literally I went out, I sat by the pool, had a book, pina colada. That was, that was my day. So I really, um, I wouldn't, if I were using a power chair, I, probably a manual chair would have sufficed just for the distances that I was going. And I was always with family. So it's looking at that as a possible option. It's unfortunate that you would need to do that. But if it is an option for people, yeah. I certainly would consider it. And yeah. one other thing I wanted to mention that, I, and I did make reference to it, I believe, but the um, the two main, let's say, airlines in Canada, like Air Canada and WestJet, both have medical departments. And so exactly. I have a, a file. So it's very important to set exactly. up a file with them. So they, when I said my long-term file, the long-term is now four years. So every four years I would renew it, but my doctor 
writes to them and tells them expressly like what my needs are, what I can do, not do. And the, the advantage of that is, is twofold. One is when I go to book my travel, I deal with them as far as like seating to make sure that um, myself, whomever I'm traveling with, they were, I'm seated somewhere that is easy to access. So the lift up armrest is easy to get into, ideally in a bulkhead situation. Mm -hmm. And the other um, thing, and I'm sure some people may be aware, but if you're not, there is um, a legislation that was passed called like one person, one fare. And it actually was done in relation more to obesity and people that needed to take up two seats and they used to get charged for two. And so there was a whole class action lawsuit that centered around that. But as a result of that, it ended up benefiting the disability community that if for flights only within Canada, unfortunately, mm -hmm. Um, within Canada, if I were to travel to Vancouver, for example, um, my husband can travel with me at a very reduced rate of um, simply paying the taxes. So it's like an okay. attendant fare. So it's, um, it's well worth it having that file set up with both, whether it be Air Canada and WestJet, both airlines, it doesn't matter, but it's absolutely, um, I, I find it a bit of a game changer. It's a little bit of a bonus. There's so many extra expenses that you incur as a wheelchair user, there's just so many, so many additional costs that go along through life. It's kind of nice that there's this little break when it mm -hmm. comes to traveling, like um, within Canada. And, and the and the advantage of that also, I know with WestJet, because I don't use Air Canada, is that there's a direct number. So if you have to call to make changes or have any questions about your flights, you could call directly to them, and you don't have to go through the long uh, three-hour wait with the general population, which is good oh also about the week oh, i wanted to say i always travel with my power and manual chair and in case something happened to my power chair and also the manual chair is very easy for us to load everything onto to push um when we're going from a to b so that's just, it's like our own little personal carrier for our luggage <laughs> And I mentioned one more thing um, about traveling with the service dog that the airlines required to leave a seat in between for the dog for room seating or like not that the dogs sit up in this but floor room. Yeah. And uh, so you're like. Did we lose you, Phil? Turned off, sorry. That's just, okay. Yeah, I'm there still. Okay. I think I am. Oh, my, yeah. I'm, oh, there I am. Yeah, yeah you were just okay. freezing a little bit, but okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry about that. That's okay. Did, you, did it come through what I said or did it freeze me right uh, out? Uh, just the end part, I think, was frozen. Yeah. Oh. So that they leave oh, a seat in between. Yeah, they leave a seat in between for the dog. Um, so he has the foot room. Dog doesn't get in the chair, but... Uh, there is the room there for the dog too. So, okay. yeah, I've had them try to pull that one fast one on me and say, oh, no, 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 no. I said, well, you go back out and look up the regulation, but it's, that's the regulation. So, yeah, okay. they've tried Thanks, to put Phil. somebody in between us. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Nikki, you've got your hand up again. Yes, I'm I have a question regarding um, traveling to Europe. I know the person that was just speaking, uh, he, had, he went to Europe, but it, was there a special travel agency that he called? I just want to find out how he was uh, able to do it and where he went and was it accessible? Like the places, the restaurants um, and things like that. When, when you say Europe, um, that's a really big, Place. I know like you have broad. somewhere in mind. Okay, so where did um, was it Pip Pop? Where did you go? Yeah, yeah. We we went to the Netherlands, and uh, so we spent three weeks in the Netherlands. Uh, we we're planning a trip back next year, and we're going to do Germany, Belgium, probably in the Netherlands, and spend more time there. But uh, um, it was, was it okay very... to get in a wheelchair? Oh, it was great. It was very accessible. Uh, better than Canada, um, a lot better than Canada. Uh, I found it very accessible with, I used a power chair on that trip and uh, very, very accessible. 
Um, was there a my, special uh, travel agency you uh, you? I went just to? used the one in Brantford. Uh, I think it was called Gulliger's. Um, I'm not sure if they're still there. I think they may. Um, and they made the arrangements for the hotel and everything. And uh, I think like two, maybe three minute walk, well, roll um, from the hotel, uh, there was a bus and train station. So, and all the buses there are accessible. The trams, like the streetcars, they yeah. were accessible. Uh, the metro, what they call wow. the metro is their uh, subway. That, subway. That's, yeah, that's all accessible too. Oh, um, wow. Everything was accessible there. Yeah, yeah, it was really okay. good. Okay, that's good to yeah. know. I live in Ottawa. Um, okay. If, if anybody's aware of a, an, of a travel agency that specializes in accessible travel in Ottawa, does anybody in the group know? But what you might want to do is go on, are, are you on Facebook? Yes. Okay. On and the, 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 what, what is the group? There's the Accessible Travel Club, which is for pretty much all of the world. And then there's Accessible Travel Club USA slash Canada or Canada slash USA. And okay. you can do search for any city, country that you're looking for. And someone will probably have asked the same question that you have. But mm -hmm. I mean, really, unless you don't want to get involved in the plan. Nowadays with the internet, you can plan your own trip, find your hotel, the hotels that you like, book the airlines directly, right, Shonda? I mean, it doesn't have Absolutely. to be done. Absolutely. No, it doesn't, it, it doesn't have to be. And there's some um, benefit to having some control over your reservation. So for hotels, for example, it, it, this is what's great. The difference, you know, say now and, and 30, 40 years ago, um, you can go online and they will now, for the most part, show you the accessible rooms. So I've, I've been to Amsterdam several times, partly because it's a, a gateway for a number of cruises. And also um, uh, my husband and I spent a week there one time when uh, he was working mm -hmm. in India and we met halfway and oh, wow. we spent a week there. So all that to say, when we were there, um, as the gentleman previously was saying, the, the access was absolutely phenomenal. But all, all you really need to do is if you pull up any number of the, the hotels, whether it be Hilton, Radisson, you'll mm -hmm. see a little accessible icon and it will often show you, is this a roll in shower or is it um, just a, a tub with a, a handheld shower? That, and the nice thing is too, they're usually toll free numbers. So it might be a Radisson that's in Amsterdam, but you can phone toll free and deal with um, someone locally who will then make direct inquiries on your behalf to ensure that you're booked in the appropriate room. Okay. Even hotels.com, when you're doing your search, you can put in wheel in shower, accessible room, all different criteria. Okay. Right through, through hotels.com. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for your question, Nikki. Okay, thank you. Uh, Joyce. Well, I was listening to uh, what Shannon was saying about finding a um, uh, places when you're in Aruba, for instance, and you found a group or a, you found someone that could take you um, on a tour. How do you look that up? How did you find that? I literally went on Google and put wheelchair accessible Aruba. And the first thing that came out was we welcome wheelchairs. So and more and more companies are having Facebook pages, Instagram pages, WhatsApp, like you name it. Like there, there's just so many ways to get in touch with this company. And what I'm finding is that they're, because communication is so much easier now than it ever has been, I, I, I think you'll find, I know I found for my most recent trip that people are incredibly responsive and it was, uh, it was really wonderful. And Sometimes one of my ports of call was uh, Curacao, for example. They do have, there was a company with accessible transport. Unfortunately, they got in touch with me shortly before and they said, you know, they had one vehicle and that's often the case in a number of places. There are not a lot of vehicles and the vehicle unfortunately was, was out of service. They needed a part, it was coming in from the States um, and so it wasn't available, but that's where you kind of go into, okay, plan B and, mm -hmm. and, and come up with uh, something else that potentially involves a little bit more 
walking and rolling and um, and something a little more local. But there there are so many companies out there now. And if you're concerned about it, like let's say for people that are just starting to travel, kind of recommend not going as far, but if you look anywhere in the United States, like the the, the rules there are just so much different and they're, they've been on that accessibility train so much longer than anybody else. So maybe, you know, for an initial journey, stick somewhere close or Vegas, go to Las Vegas. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's one of the most flat, yeah. accessible. Or, or go, to, go to a city that has held the Olympics or the Paralympics because they've made their city accessible because of the Paralympics. It's always like Barcelona and... Um, and well, I, I hear that Berlin is very accessible, although they have not hosted the Olympics. I hear it's the number one accessible city in all of Europe. Have you heard that, Shauna? It, it, it is definitely right up there. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, I have done a lot of traveling, but that was before my accident. So I'm not really comfortable. We have gone on an Alaskan cruise. And I realized after that we didn't do our research well enough and we went with Azumara because we've been with them before. But the room that we had was very small <clears throat> and uh, they didn't even know what I, I asked them for, uh, um, oh, I'm having trouble with my words today, a commode. And I had asked that before we arrived, that was one of the requests, but they didn't even know what it was. And uh, so there were a lot of things that got in the way of me being able to move about the ship and also being able to go on to the islands when we did it or the shore excursions <clears throat> because Thinking as a marrow was small ship would be able to dock, but because they were a small ship, the big ships like uh, Holland America and Princess have the ports already booked. So as a marrow couldn't get to shore. So then it's really difficult to do a transfer to get on to um, oh, those little boats that take you across. The, the tenders. Yeah, tenders. So they lifted, I did have a portable wheelchair, which my OTX um, suggested to me. And that was a good idea in a way because the idea was that they could carry me down if there were a few steps to get to the um, boat, the tender, but because these people were Filipino, I believe, I don't think they understood. And Jim was, my husband was trying to explain to them, you can't lift from the legs. You need to have a hold of the chair, but they didn't do that. And I almost fell. I didn't, but it was scary. So you need to really do your homework in terms of what ships provide the most accessibility and I, we you certainly do. do. You made, um, you mentioned medical equipment and one thing that's um, important to know, a cruise line wouldn't be the one, they wouldn't have been the ones to provide a commode. So for example, in all of the accessible rooms, if they put you in an appropriate room, which hopefully they did, yeah, they only have six rooms. So Asmar is two, right. two balconies, two ocean views, two inside rooms. So there aren't, aren't a lot of rooms on that ship to begin with. So there's not a lot of leeway if something goes wrong, but as far, normally they have a roll in shower and a, a, a seat that folds down. But a, a number of people I know prefer to use a commode chair. But what, what you need to do is either you travel with your own or there are several um, companies that have partnered up with the cruise lines. Uh, one is called like Special Needs at Sea. There are at least two that they have a relationship with the cruise line where they can arrange to have that commode in your room on the ship ready for you. Like you just, it gets all planned ahead of time. You book the medical equipment that you need. You could book a Hoyer lift. You could book a commode chair. You could book a scooter. Um, some companies actually have uh, like beach chairs depending on, on where you're going, but uh, always 
I, I'm not sure how the, it was communicated to that the cruise line might be providing with that because they, they normally, they wouldn't have that to provide to you. So yeah. th that's very unfortunate that that happened. But for people that um, want to know, there, there are companies that they've got all kinds of equipment and they've got good pictures on their website. So, you know, this is the Hoyer lift that they're talking mm -hmm. about. And some are hydraulics, some aren't power, they're not. So you can really customize it as to like, make it as close to the type of equipment that you are used to using. Yes. And one thing I've seen Marilyn do on, on a trip and, uh, and, and a number of people is like, they'll, they'll travel, like they'll have, uh, Marilyn's mentioned traveling with your spare chair, but I seem to recall you'd have a, a commode chair or um, a travel uh, commode chair travel commode, and, and you load it up. Like, so it's like, it's literally like your luggage rack. So there's your, because some people are saying, well, I don't want to travel with my commode chair. That's awkward. I'm feeling uncomfortable with that. And it's like, it's not a big deal at all. You literally, you've got your luggage on it. You're pushing it through. It saves you a whole lot of hassle at the airport. And then you have your own personal equipment when you're traveling. And that for me, like I have a, a portable shower bench. It pulls up, it goes in a bag and it's, and it's great. And it's like a big burlap. It's, it's very solid. And uh, it's, I think it's called the tubby too. I think they still sell them. There's different companies that sell collapsible um, shower benches. Um, but for people that like with the commode, you can literally not take it apart and just travel with it. And, and it's good to go. So it's just something to think about if you're not able to rent equipment at destination, because you want to make sure like, the, the bathroom, I think, is the number of all the questions I get asked. The top questions always relate to the bathroom in some capacity. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's all you... the area of problem, right? Between the toilet and the shower. Yeah. I was going to say, I have a travel shower chair that comes with its own suitcase, and it actually has a slide bar so that if you're stuck with a hotel room that does not have a wheel and shower, you can slide your chair part of the, your seat part of the chair across into the tub to shower, which wow. is coming many times. Yeah. And it's all compact in a square suitcase, which of What's course is not. Um, I will look up the name of the wheelchair company, but that's pretty much all they sell are these um, travel commode chairs. Oh, thanks. I'll look it up. So you can send that to me, Marilyn, and I can send that out. Okay, thanks. Um, Shauna, do you mind repeating the name of the company that you said that people can get rental equipment from for the cruises? Uh, one, of the, one of the companies is called Special Needs at Sea. Special Needs at Sea, okay. okay. And someone just put a comment in that they took the travel buddy to New York City and it was great. Okay, um, okay so I just wanna, so it is um, just shortly after four. We do still have a few more questions. I just want to let everyone know on the call, if you have to go, um, please go, go ahead. And Sean, I know you mentioned you're okay to stay a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Marilyn, are you okay to stay and answer a couple more questions? Yep. Okay, um, so Leander, I think you're next. And, or sorry, Joyce, was there? Did you have no, any other No, questions? I think that was great. Thank you very okay. much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Leander. A uh, couple of comments and a, a couple of questions for Shauna. Um, one thing to point out is these days with everything uh, being done electronically, um, you can find an accessible travel, an accessible travel agent it doesn't have to be in the same city that you reside. You can do things by distance. You can have a travel agent that's located in Vancouver and you can be on the opposite coast. Um, so if you Google accessible travel agents, uh, there's various websites in, including Flight Center uh, that will list uh, um, uh, personnel that they have that specialize in accessibility. Um, and, it's, and I've used Shauna many times. It's great to have someone with that specialty, even better if they themselves have a physical disability because then they're just that much more aware of all the... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. All, all the all the needs and, and potential issues. Um, before, when there was discussion of chairs being damaged, I just wanted to highlight that that's an important reason to hold on to uh, one of your previous wheelchairs. So if you've been in a chair for a while and you're getting a second wheelchair, uh, you might not want to automatically think about donating or getting rid of your old equipment. If it could still serve you for emergency purposes, it's probably going to fit you better than a loaner chair that you would get from your vendor 
until a, a new custom chair could be made to your dimensions. So there's value holding on to some of your previous equipment if it's still functional in the event that something happened to your wheelchair, whether it's a result of damage from air travel or uh, damage by any other means. Um, uh, with regards to online travel websites, one thing I've observed is uh, I often use TripAdvisor as a tool to find hotels and then I contact them directly. But um, a lot of these websites, as Marilyn mentioned, uh, will have a box that you can check uh, uh, indicating that you're looking for an accessible room and then it will then sort the hotels uh, only showing you ones that are accessible. Um, uh, I've discovered that when you're going to destinations uh, that are developing countries, that accessibility information on those websites like Expedia and TripAdvisor isn't always accurate. If you're going to uh, a country with high accessibility standards like Canada, the United States, and several European countries, uh, it can often be trusted. But if you're going to Vietnam or somewhere more exotic or somewhere in Africa, um, that information, do whether it's a language issue or their interpretation of wheelchair accessible, um, may not be correct. Um, so it's always good, even if you're using a booking website like that, to contact the hotel directly and uh, uh, just confirm indeed that the room is accessible, that there's no stairs that might impede with your, uh, your access. So you always want to check those things if the travel, if you're not using a travel agent who's checking them for you. Um, and then for Shauna, uh, uh, are the, in cruises, are the decks frequently carpeted because that could cause, um, that could be difficult over the course of a long cruise uh, wheeling those long corridors all the time. The decks obviously outside are not carpeted, but are the internal decks uh, in the ship frequently carpeted? Uh, because uh, for someone who uses a manual wheelchair, uh, that's something that could cause you to be more fatigued um, uh, and, you know, and impact your endurance if uh, you're, you're, you're wheeling on carpet all day in the ship. And then when there's excursions, you're doing even more wheeling outside. Um, uh, and then uh, the second question for Shauna is, uh, remember you booked an Adriatic cruise for me uh, many years ago. And I remember one of the stops had, uh, you, the ship could not actually dock. So they had to use smaller boats in order for people to uh, get to shore for, um, to, to visit the, the, the city whose port they were in. Is that kind of information frequently provided uh, by the, the, the cruise lines so you can identify um, that there may be some ports like that that you might be not be able to access because there there might not be a ramp access because they're using smaller boats and may in fact use a um, some sort of floating gangway and, and a stairwell. Uh, that's it. Hey, uh, I'll always start with the second one because it's still fresh in my mind. The um, as for the um, as tendering, they do identify. This is the first question I'm always asking when I'm looking at an itinerary is how many of these ports are tendered. Uh, and they they will let you know because they know there are some that are always docked. There are some that are generally tendered, uh, and then there's some that can go either way depending on uh, who gets there first. So it's it's being aware um, that 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 potential is always there when it comes to tendering. There is always that possibility of potentially not getting into port. It's uh, it's an unfortunate reality. I've I've yet to like you know in my essays at my 300 to see I've yet to not be able to get to port other than in an instance where all of the passengers were not getting in. But I do very honestly choose itineraries as best I can that do not have um, the tendering just so I can have that peace of mind. The, um, the carpeting component, there, there tends to be a lot of carpeting just in the passenger deck areas. And there, but there are a number of floors that are not. And so having just got off the ship less than a month ago, um, I can tell you, first of all, like the accessible rooms tend to be quite close to the elevator. So when you're getting off the elevator, you're not going a great distance to get to your room. So what I'll do is if I'm going to somewhere at the other end of the ship, I'll get on the elevator and I always go down to a deck that I know is not carpeted. So generally deck five, for example, well, which let's say the promenade deck, it's, it's open or deck 12. There's certain key decks that have no carpeting whatsoever. Or they're straight run through. So you develop, you get little roots in your mind. And what happens is when you get on board the ship, usually with your key card, you also get a deck plan for the ship. And you can kind of 
like root it out. I'm, I always have that with me in terms of knowing, okay, where am I and, and how to get to where I'm going. The nice thing is they, they, they all, they all are set up pretty much similarly. So if you've been on one, you tend to know, okay, my dining is here. My entertainment is here. Um, but it is coming up with strategies. Now for me personally, I'm always trying to get and burn as many calories as I can. So I will go out of my way to take the extra long route and go to the next bank of elevators so I can be going down more and more carpet. So I'm always actually, to be honest, seeking it out because I, I tend to eat very well, as you can tell, and like not wasting away. And uh, I, I love to eat, I love the food. And so I make a point of exercising as much like, as I can. And all that to say, there's also a deck that is, it's like a walking, jogging track because I think there are other people who are in the same situation that they wanna be, um, moving and so what I love is there's a deck where you can actually go and get in a lot of laps of movement if you go like early in the morning tends to be a good time late in the day or in the full-on sun like right around noon for crazy people like me so it's uh, there are ways around it but yes Sandra there is that's a good point there there certainly is carpeting thank you Shauna um okay Ron you've had your hand up for a while Okay, I'll be quick. I see everybody's had some uh, problems, it seems, with Air Canada. I fly to Toronto about three or four times a year for, for the last few years for different reasons, and they bend over backwards to look after me. Uh, never had an issue. Matter of fact, um, one time there was kind of drizzling rain when we stopped in Toronto, and one of the stewardesses was standing outside my scooter with an umbrella over top so it wouldn't get wet. So I thought that was, I just had to make that comment of my experiences with Air Canada has been more than, more than thankful for them. And one other thing, if I may, has anybody got any ideas uh, on insurance? And thanks so much for everybody for your time for travel insurance. Thank you. When, you, when you're mentioning travel insurance, you mean in terms of where to purchase it or? Um... I, are you like referring to travel, like travel insurance for, like for your for yourself, for your? Yeah, say like like um, before we were always covered under my wife's uh, plan uh, for where she was working for travel insurance, so it was never a concern. Now, unfortunately, she retired and is on my nerves, staying home every day. <laughs> no, no. Anyway, we have to get other insurance, and I just wondered if anybody had any ideas on what we should do or. Just phone travel agencies, I guess. Yeah, it, any any travel agency at all will um, will sell insurance. Like they're actually legally bound. Like if a travel agent is selling you travel, they need to offer you insurance. And in fact, if you decline the insurance, you end up you do actually in fact have to sign a waiver that you were offered insurance and you declined it. And so it's it's easy to get. And even you'll find on a lot of um, trips that you book online. There, there will be a part where you, you know, you, you book and then it gets to the next section and it'll, it'll quote the insurance right there and you can add it on in that capacity as well. So it, it's, it's just a part and parcel of, um, of the booking process. So for the most part, some things you don't need to insure. So if you have hotels that are cancelable, you, do, you don't need to tend to include those in the, in the amount or the value that you're insuring. But insurance is, when you say it's an easy product to come by, any number of people. And then Manulife is the one that comes to mind. It's a big one for travel, but their Alliance is another, all of the travel, all of the insurance companies have a travel branch to them. So if you have a local agency that you're familiar with, you may as well like just deal with someone local and that would be great. And good for the thumbs up to Air Canada. And not because my daughter works there. I mean, she has you know her own horror stories to tell, but I just travel with Air Canada. Like if, if I can, I travel there in Canada and partly it's because I know their system. I know the medical department. I know where the check-in is for persons with disabilities. Like at the Pearson airport and I'm just so familiar with it. It's giving me a high level of comfort. And I just want to pop something in there that it hasn't come up. And I'm surprised because I thought most of the call today would be about it. It's like post pandemic travel, like people, if, if I can just give one piece of advice with regards to travel right now, and it's absolutely critical. Um, you absolutely must right now, it's like, if you are traveling out of the Pearson airport, which is the, the Toronto airport, 
um, or out of the Montreal. There's two airports right now that if you're traveling out of. If I'm flying to the United States, I know it used to be two hours. You had to be there two hours ahead. Now you have to be there a minimum of three hours ahead of time. And that is a firm three hours, like not like two hours and 55 minutes. You've got to be there because it's uh, the, there are so many staff shortages. Not And it's not just, let's say, because I'm with Air Canada that the staff shortage is there. The staff shortages are everywhere. They're with security, they're with baggage, they're with check-in. There are just so many things um, going on. You want to give yourself that extra time and peace of mind that you're not going to miss your flight. So just keep that in mind. It is a whole new era for travel right now. And everyone's out there wanting to get back and traveling. There's a big, big demand and there's this huge shortage. It's not just with the, the airline and travel, but it's in the service industry overall. And you'll see that in restaurants. You'll see that in stores. It's a good time if you are unemployed and seeking a job. There are jobs, lots of them. So, okay. Thanks, Shauna. We've got three hands up. So hopefully we can get to these last three questions. Uh, Nadine, you've been waiting. Thank you. Thank you for waiting. Hi, I just wanted to know, like, when you transfer to the seat on the plane, do you have to bring your um, your Rojo? That's entirely up to you in terms of if, if you prefer to sit on a cushion um, and then you can. Now, I want to comment about the Rojo. <laughs> so I learned this. It's you've got to deflate it a little bit because the, we were talking earlier about the, there's a pressurization in the cabin, there's a point where your rojo is going to expand and like it, your rojo will get bigger. You've got to let some air out. So you, you wanna make sure you travel to your pump in case you need to reinflate it later. But okay. if, if it's a rojo you're using, personally, I'm the, the cushion I'm using is a little too high. So I find if I put that on my seat, I'm sitting just a bit too high and my feet aren't flat on the ground. And so it's, it's, it's not that comfortable. So I'm better just sitting on the seat itself. So I tend to do a lot of, like I have an armrest on either side. So I'll be doing a lot of like pressure relief, like during the, the, the trip, just to try and get, you know, and sometimes people are wondering, what am I doing? But it's sort of like, you know, chair setups, but basically it, that's, that is important. Whether you're sitting on your cushion though, or, or not, make sure you bring your cushion on board the plane and store it above you if you're not sitting on it. Okay. Yeah, I don't do that, Shauna. I leave mine on my power wheelchair and okay. then the back folded down and it's all duct tape. So nothing is going to happen to okay. the cushion. And I think what I've done in the past is I have a little thin gel cushion, maybe three quarters of an inch thick that we bring with us to put um, on the seat of the plane rather than my, my actual cushion, which is not a Rojo, it's a gel, a gel cushion. But just, just while I... I have the name of the uh, shower chair. It's a go anywhere commode chair. That's the actual name of it. Just in case anyone was interested. Thanks, Marilyn. And also, do you always um, yeah. able to rent a hospital bed with a with an air mattress? That would really depend on where you're traveling. I think you would need to be traveling somewhere that's fairly progressive in terms of like definitely like within the United States but not in a in a small city although some of the, the cities will deliver I mean when I say city some of the companies will deliver but that's something you would want to check out so with for example the the, the company I mentioned special needs at sea even though that's their name they will bring equipment to hotels as well um, okay. but that's you would want to check that out and you might if, if you're flexible in terms of destinations you would want to choose a destination that's a little bit more, as I say, a little bit more modern that has more amenities. Okay. And in mm -hmm. terms of uh, attendant, do you have do you bring your own attendant or do you are you able to get attendants wherever you go? Personally, I would always be traveling with someone that I'm familiar with that knows my needs and and uh, that I'm compatible with, um, okay. especially for traveling. Uh, but there have been companies, unfortunately, I, I don't have a, a name at the moment, but um, I do recall having a, a girlfriend that actually ran a company uh, and it, a, a, that essentially they matched people up, they provided attendance. And I know a number of people, let's say people who have regular attendant care, 
that they 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 know attendants. Often, what they'll do is make a private arrangement with that attendant when they have time off or they're able to book time off to travel with mm. them. And I do see that happen a lot. There may be rules that you're not allowed to do that, but look, just you know, that that is often what happens is people will make that private arrangement, and it is well well worth traveling with somebody that that knows your needs. You don't want to get to a destination and find out that well yes they they're offering you attendance services but they don't they don't know how to do uh, how to transfer or whatever your needs might be. Shauna, mm -hmm. do some of the cruise ships now have single rooms? So say if you and your husband were traveling and you wanted to bring a PSW with you but not have the PSW sleep in your room, you and your husband could have your own private room and the PSW could have a small single bedroom. Do they have that available? They now do. They didn't used to. And now yeah. there's a lot more demand for that, uh, for, for solo travelers. So not all of the cruise lines have gone in that direction. And unfortunately, the reason Marilyn mentions that is if, if with cruise lines, if you're putting only one person in a room, there's some cruise lines that are still going to charge you a double occupancy rate. Like they're going to charge you for two because you're taking up a full room. But um, one that my dad just cruised on, like Cunard, like my dad, um, my mom sadly passed away about five years ago and my dad was traveling um, by himself for uh, some period of time. And he was the one who actually filled me on on all of these like single cabins. I'm like, what are you talking about? Because I had never heard of them, but they're, they were fairly new. But uh, Norwegian is one cruise line and, and Cunard um, is another that I'm aware of a bit off the top of my head that actually do offer those rooms. They do sell out quickly though, because they are in big demand because a lot of people want to travel. They don't necessarily have someone that they want or need to travel with. And so mm -hmm. the rooms do go quickly. So plan the further ahead you can plan for any type of vacation. It doesn't matter what kind of vacation you're taking. As Mira says, like, do spend more time. I, and I, in the same, I spend more time planning travel than the actual travel experience itself. But it really pays off in terms of having the peace of mind when you get there that you know that, that things are in place. And it just means a lot less to go wrong. I have a question submitted by chat, which is, um, Marilyn, have you traveled to Africa, South Africa, Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania, or Kenya? I have been to Botswana and South Africa, and it was a with um, Epic Enabled, I believe it was. Uh, no, Endeavor Safaris. And I actually camped um, in Botswana in a tent um, while we were on safari and it was all wheelchair accessible. The truck had a ramp and it was all part of a tour also to South Africa. It was great, it was the best vacation ever. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna ask Charlie to match you with this wonderful individual who has a question, I'm sure they can benefit from your mentorship. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Marilyn, can you repeat what you just said about Endeavor? Something Endeavor Safaris. Now this was about, oh my goodness, 14 years ago now. I think they're still in business. It I, was a great- I think they are. And there's yeah. there are a couple of other companies now, like this isn't, the, the incredible thing is who would think that you would have these accessible safaris, but, mm -hmm. but, but they're out there and their companies offering them. I think Flamingo, Flamingo Tours is another. So there are definitely companies that are offering that experience. And it is, it's a once in a lifetime bucket list yeah. kind of trip. But what I liked about them was that it wasn't a giraffe coming up to your hotel room with, with tame wild animals. We were actually out on safari looking for these wild animals. Oh, wow. Um, okay. Yeah, it was just out of this world. You said I that was you. called Endeavor? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And the Flamingo, what was the other uh, one? Flamingo, I believe it was Flamingo Tours. But once again, like literally if you go into Google and accessible wheelchair safari, like boom, it'll that'll right. come up. Accessible Travel Club, Facebook. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, we have one last question, but Shauna, I know you, it's 426, and I know you've got, you've got to go. Should we, if, if you oh, have I'm to good, go, I'm, go ahead. I'm, I'm, no, no, I'm good to 430. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So Joyce, I think you're the last person that has your hand up. Oh, uh, I wondered about river cruises. Is it, are any of them accessible? 
sadly, no. Um, and I, I so wish, I so, so wish that they were, but any, any of them that would ever tell you that they were, they're not. And here's what happens with river cruises is that they, there are a lot of river cruises that are traveling. And when they dock, you're not necessarily docking right next to the pier. They dock yeah. beside one another. And so depending on when you get in, you could be here and there are two ships beside you. And so people are going through like ships to, to get off. And there are very few, if any, accessible staterooms on board. There's one company that they've put in two accessible rooms, but it would presume that you use a walker or you use something where you have the mobility to be able to walk off the ship. So at this point in time, it's not an option unless you have some mobility in terms of being able to walk. And I, I look forward to that day when there, there is a means to do that because that, that is a wonderful, wonderful way to see a lot more, uh, a lot more cities like up close and personal. There are canal cruises though. Mm -hmm. I did one um, oh. in Europe several years ago and they had volunteers that would come on the canal boat with us and there was a lift and there was a bedroom and you stayed right in town and it was wonderful and I can look up the information. So not quite the same as a, as the river cruise, but it's still you're on the water and you're going through uh, small towns. And what part of uh, Europe are you talking about? That was in England, I believe. Oh my God, it was so yeah. many years ago, but um, I'll, I'll look it up. Yeah, England have a lot of canal um, boats. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, Leander just put in the chat too, Nile in Egypt, at least one boat with elevator, according to a friend with a spinal cord injury. But it's that off. would be Leander with a spinal cord injury. I think he, he did that trip. So, but uh, Leander is very brave. And that's where at the beginning, when I talked about that survey, in terms of what kind of traveler are you, Leander is like extreme <laughs> adventure traveler and he's up for anything. And so there are people that would be very comfortable with the, the Nile tri trip that he did, and other people would be like, well, maybe not. <laughs> but, so it's everyone somewhere on the spectrum is just knowing where you are. And it's, uh, I, I very much admire and respect people that have like that open mindedness to just like, hey, I'm going for it. And Leander's one of those people. And just a one quick example. Well, in Costa Rica a few years ago, I went zip lining and they had, a, and I'm not a lightweight, and they had about four guys and they had me sitting on a dining room chair, carrying me through the jungle up to the next area where you'd be zip lining to um, or from. And it was, it was just amazing. So whatever you feel comfortable doing, you can do. I will be stopping the recording now. But thank you everyone who shared their experiences and this group can continue chatting. Thank you, Shauna. Thank you, Marilyn and Julie. Thank you for putting together the fabulous peer connection. Have a good day, guys. Yeah, thanks, it was Lisa. my pleasure.